Glinda is like Glendala is located on two lakes. There's the upper lake and the lower lake. And the upper lake, at the very back of that, is St. Kevin's Cave. And so you really can't get to it today. It's a dangerous um, ascent, uh, descent from the mountain to get to it. So it's not open to tourists. But you can look across to the spot. It's quite beautiful. Now the gateway in the Glendola is interesting. This is a monastic community, I'll tell you more about that. But this is the only surviving example of a medieval gateway into an early monastic city in Ireland. Mm -hmm. It would have been two stories and the gatekeeper would have lived on the second story. And when you go in, on the right is this cross inscribed on the stone, the sanctuary stone. Uh, whoops, did I miss one? Yeah, not go back. I don't, I can't make it go back for some reason. Let me see if I can. Oh, there we go. Okay, so these are just some scenes from um, Glendala. This is a window in the old cathedral on the left. And you can see all of these tombstones. All of these sacred places are still active burial sites, which is crazy. Um, so there are tombstones from, from, of every design and from all generations, and now they've decided that only the families who have members buried there, after mm -hmm. a few more generations, they're going to close all these graveyards. Um, but the local families who always had their families buried there can do it for a few more generations. The Realm Tower is um, typical of these monastic settlements and also um, ecclesiastical and other places. They would have these towers as watchtowers that they could see when the Vikings were coming because the Vikings were constantly attacking these communities. Um, and the door is, you can see the door on the left up a little mm -hmm. way. They put it up high because of the fact that lower down it compromised the structure of the whole tower because it oh, wasn't. Mm -hmm. And they would collapse. They finally figured out the door had to go up higher. So there's a ladder to it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess so. Yeah, and that one has, I think that's the one that's got seven stories inside, or that mm -hmm. might be another one. But anyway, it was, they had stories inside that you would go to, and bells. So there's some debate about whether they were actually used for protection during Viking attacks or whether they were used mainly for calls to prayer and as watchtowers. I guess the jury's out on that. So Kevin's fame had spread far and wide because he did not stay in his cell forever, only for a while. And this whole area grew into a renowned seminary of saints and scholars in the parent of several other seminaries. And it was attacked by the Vikings over and over, but it lasted till 1398 when the English attacked it. And then the dissolution, dissolution of the monasteries in 1539 finished it off. So now it's a place where people come and visit. In fact, Prince Charles and Camilla had been there the very day we were there, earlier in the day. We just missed it. We saw their car, uh, their entourage going down the road as we came in, they were going out. So we were probably lucky to have missed them. Aww. Um, this is um, one of the, the deer, and I never knew, but someone told me it's good luck to see a deer at Glendale. So it was lovely. The deer just stood there and let us admire her or him until another group came up and then it took off. Up a little higher in Ireland, at, I mean over to the, yeah, the northwest is Clonmacnoise and St. Kieran was the saint that started this monastery. He was born in 1512. He went to the Aran Islands to study with St. Enda for seven years <laughs> and was ordained a priest. And while he was there, he had this vision of a great miraculous tree growing out of the center of Ireland. 
this branch has stretched over the whole country and provided fruit and the birds took seed from the fruits to other lands. So Saint Enda realized the tree was Kirin himself. I think I'm saying that right. So he told Kirin that he should found a monastery in Central Island. So Kirin did that after seven more years of studying on other islands, the Aran Islands. Um, he finally went to Climate Noise and it's on the west bank of the River Shannon. He said, many souls will go to heaven from this site and the Lord is especially present here and Christians will always visit this place. And it is an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous place. Um, did I miss one there? I thought I heard two clicks. That's right, okay. So he's <clears throat> numbered among the 12 apostles of Ireland, and he developed a role which many monasteries in Ireland followed, the role of Siren. He too lived in full harmony with nature, and his dun cow, if you've ever heard of the book of the dun cow, that's where this comes from. His dun cow lived with him and supplied the monastery with milk the whole time he was alive. In the 12th century, the skin of this cow was used to create the book of the dun cow, which today is kept at the Royal Irish Academy. And when he was a student, a tame fox used to deliver his homework to his teacher. <laughs> He died really young. He died of the plague at age 33, and he asked not to be buried, but to be left on the hilltop as if his were the bones of a deer. And I'm gonna go back to this slide, because I think this depiction is so cool, because you can see the fox in there. Yeah. Now that, that looks more like a boar, but I'm thinking it should have been a cow. <laughs> You can see. And this is on the Aran Islands? This is no, this is actually in Central Ireland, okay. you know, where he was okay. finally supposed to go build it. So this tells a little bit about the area. It's, um, it was the largest Irish monastery in the 8th and 9th centuries, a center of learning and culture, known as the Smithy of Saints. And 1,500 to 2,000 monks lived there, uh, and people came from monks came from all over Europe to study and learn there. It developed into a monastic city and was the most famous in Ireland and known for its uh, calligraphy, artworks made from stone and metal. It was an important spot, and it also suffered from Viking raids, 40 Viking raids. And in 1552, um, Oliver Cromwell's people came through and destroyed the cathedral and the high crosses that hadn't already been destroyed by the Vikings. But they still have, it's two high crosses there that are in the museum. They brought them in from outside and then they put replicas that look just like a little thing outside. So people do still come to Climate Moise today. They have a modern day chapel there and the Pope John Paul visited there, um, and it's a place for Protestants and Catholics come together there for reconciliation services. So you know, Saint Kieran's thought that Christians would always gather here is still very true. It's still an active cemetery, and I don't have any. I didn't include pictures of it, but the nuns place is outside the gates. You can walk down to that. It's quite beautiful as well. And it's right on the river, the Shannon River. And um, geologically, it was settled. The reason they settled here, the, the glaciers, as they receded, had left these pathways of stone that went through the bogs, so these people came down those pathways through the bogs that mm -hmm. allowed them and, cool. and were able to settle this spot along the river. That's fascinating. I know, yeah. So, you can see the River Shannon there, and uh, oh, that's, the, that's the cathedral. They're in the process of trying to restore some, they've restored mm -hmm. a few of the buildings. You can see this one on the left has been. Um, well restored. And 
This little one down in the left hand corner is, if I'm remembering correctly, that was actually where he was buried um, at one time. And this is one of the high crosses. It's a replica, but it's in its original position. You can see it here and also on the edge over on that middle picture. Mm -hmm. So just a few scenes from there. Now C. Coleman McDowell um, lived around the same time. He was, he was a recluse on Ennismore, one of the Aran Islands. You can sense a trend here. And then he moved in 590 to a cave at the Burren, County Clare. Now the Burren is the most curious and interesting geological area of um, Ireland. It's where Mediterranean and Alpine plants grow side by side because of the um, limestone and the way the um, atmosphere is there. It's beautiful in a weird sort of way. But Coleman moved there and lived in a cave um, in the Burren, and he founded the monastery of Kelmagdaw and governed it as abbot bishop. He wanted God to show him where to build a monastery, and so he asked God to give him a son, and while walking through the Burren woods, his sanctuary fell off the roof, <laughs> and he said, that's God's son, and he built the monastery on that place. It is said that Coleman declared that no person or animal in the Diocese of Kelmacdaw would ever die of a lightning strike, something that appears true to this day. And I wish I'd known that because we went to Kelmacdaw, it was looking very stormy. I would have had to worry about lightning. Not that I did, but. <laughs> so here's a wonderful, there are lots of fun tales about him, but this one I love. Um, he had fasted throughout Lent, and on Easter morning he asked his servant if his servant found anything special for their Easter meal. The servant said, only a small fowl and the usual herbs. So Coleman prayed that the Lord would provide an appropriate meal. So at the same time, Coleman's cousin, King Guerre, was sitting down to a banquet. No sooner had the dishes been served than they were spirited away by unseen <laughs> hands. The king and his retinue followed, only to find the banquet spread before Coleman and his servant. <laughs> An area of limestone pavement nearby is called to this day the Road of the Dishes. I can't pronounce the Irish. Now, we were on the Road of the Dishes and had no clue this mm -hmm. is what it was, but now I know what the, the myth around that. <laughs> Coleman loved birds and animals, and he had a rooster who served as his alarm clock. <laughs> <laughs> 